Okay. Um, so I think it'd be fun to now shift to some of your observations uh, around the church. Mm -hmm. And um, there were three topics that you wanted to talk about. Um, the first is race and Mormonism. The second is Mormons and social justice. And then the third is tribalism and Mormon identity. And I, let, let's just take each one um, mm -hmm. at a time and, mm -hmm. and have a chance for you to talk about some of your thoughts. Would that work? Sure. Okay. So race and Mormonism, uh, where are we? <laughs> um, broadly speaking. Um, you know, I think, um, I think there is of late and, and maybe this is the forms I'm in. There's a growing, um, awakening that, um, you know, uh, we're not good on this, you know? And again, I, I, I don't know about, but, but we're, I mean, I think we're forming two camps, right? And, Generally, I think we are, as a country and as a church, starting to identify more um, on issues of race. And I think there are some positive things here is that people are saying like, oh, I, I am white. And maybe that means I have these privileges. I've never seen race before. And maybe I'm seeing it now. So that, that's good, right? I think like, oh, maybe you have a different experience than me. You know, I've had friends of mine say, it never occurred to me that it would have been different for you, right? Um, so that I think is a good awakening that's happening as we're having all these dialogues across race. And I think the internet is great for this, right? Like someone just sharing an experience and other people observing it and being like, oh, like, you know, now I know a little bit more about what, what that perspective is. Um, I think there's also, um, and this do you, is... Do you mean in progressive Mormonism? Do you mean in yeah. the church broadly, or do you mean in American culture? What, I mean what, progressive Mormonism in that. Okay, in that. so you're talking about blogs, Facebook groups, podcasts that are yeah. for kind of liberal thinky, progressive, or post -Mormon. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's a good, I think... Um, but you know, are you, do you agree with me that that's probably a really small percentage of the church? I think so. I was going to say, I think it, broadly in, the, in Mormonism, I think I've seen also... Um, a, 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 backlash and hostility um, toward people who say, you know, I, I, I've, I grew up in a church that I, I didn't see like out and out over racism. And I'm seeing that more now. And part of that is where we're at as a country. I think um, the racists are emboldened. Um, this is not just Trump, but this is recent. And so I, I've seen a lot of disconcerting things in the church generally about, you know, the, the other and, and Muslim immigrants. I, I could, you know, and this is where, you know, yes, the Trump thing, but like Utah going for Trump, you know, and Mormons that I know is just saying all these things, well, you know, the, the refugees and, um, and how can Mormons, how can Mormons support a Muslim ban? You know, say what you want about this ban, but this is a ban that is religiously oriented, right? How can the Mormon community support this, you know, and yet they do. And I think part of that's it is gotta, that's got to strike really deep to your heart because mm -hmm. you are a former Muslim immigrant and your family was in some ways saved by your chance to immigrate. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this, this can't strike more personal for you. It cannot. Yeah. And so this is where I, you know, I think like, this is not, this is not, who you are, you guys, like, I, you know, I want to like, remember who you are, Mormon church, <laughs> you know, um, don't, you know, this is not, this is not the Mormon church that I knew, because growing up, it really felt like, I mean, you know, part of it is like this missionary sense of it, and, you know, um, you, you, there are problems there, but they're really always, I have always felt like, you know, come, you know, bring your culture, and we accept anyone as long as you, you know, uh, check these boxes and now immediately I'm seeing no, you know, uh, Muslims are a different category. And I've, I've heard the most bigoted things from members of the church. I've never, heard, I was in really society once and, and an older woman um, prayed, you know, for our soldiers to kill as many Muslims as possible because, you know, uh, they're the devil and whatever. And, and it's just like, what, you know, um, and, and I think that's what it is. I, mean, I think we really have divided. There are, Mormons who see Muslims as evil, you know, and, and because religious, you know, uh, religion tends to break people off into good and evil, I think people can slip into that. And I've, I've seen that a lot more these days. Um, and that's unfortunate. And it's obviously it's post 9-11, um, you know, uh, sentimentality. It's partly Trump, but it really does feel like um, much more anti-Islam than I've ever, ever felt. Mm. Yet there were, you know, Mormon scholars, there's, you know, a group of Mormon law professors who filed a brief against the refugee ban and citing their Mormon faith saying, you know, um, 
these, uh, we as Mormons oppose any sort of religious discrimination because of what we've been through, you know? So, so, so I think the church, you know, really should be a moral leader on this. And, and here again, we're circling back to Mitt Romney. He really has come out, um, recently opposed to, you know, some of the racism and, and out and out, um, anti-Islamic sentiments. Um, and so, uh, in some ways it seems like we're trying to get better as a church. And in some ways it seems like it is a little bit worse than it used to be. And it's probably disorienting for someone who's trying to make sense and monitor progress. I just want to make a shout out for an interview I did just a few days ago with a man named Sean Carter. He's a graduate. He's, he's, he's a black American graduate of Harvard law school. He and his wife joined the church in Mesa, Arizona. And he recently has left the church over what he calls white supremacy. And mm -hmm. that was a bit of a clickbaity type title, mm -hmm. but he talks about white supremacy, not in terms of mm -hmm. uh, sheets, you know, with holes cut out over the head, you know, mm -hmm. KKK stuff. He talks about white supremacy as 100 apostles in a row being white men, you know, yeah. and yeah. just this idea that white is supreme that may not even ever be explicitly said but that is lived out in our leadership and in our discourse. Do you have any observations or thoughts about that? I mean, I, I, I grew up in the Mormon church feeling like I was inferior because of my race. You know, God's white, uh, Jesus is white, and Prophets everyone are white. Is white. The, the Nef are white. Nephites are white. Nephites are white. You know, you get cursed with dark skin. Every dark person that plays any role in any historical document is brown, <laughs> right? Or every good is person bad. is white. Every bad yeah. person is brown. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's it's hard not to avoid, to avoid that conclusion, you know. So yeah, white supremacy. Maybe we're not lynching. We're not condoning violence. Blah blah. blah. But yes, I mean, I think dig down in anyone's heart, and it's there. You know, and I think this is a racial conversation, I think, that I'm seeing in the left progressive blogs coming out and saying, like, oh, I'm all of a sudden recognizing this, um, this white privilege or, you know, this yeah. white um, dominance, right? I mean, even like Lord of the Rings, or was that Lord of the Rings? Uh, Game of Thrones. I just started watching watch one episode, right? And it's, you know, these like, I don't know if it, you watch Game of Thrones or not, but it, it's like this one, you know, uh, all the white people and then they like go uh, this is the first episode. So I don't know much else, but they go and then oh, there's like these backwards group of brown people. It's all, the only brown people. They're like they're called Jothrakis, which sounds a lot like Iraqis, and they they're like ugga booga, like killing each other, like you know having these crazy things. They're beasts, right? And and you know these are my people, right? Like if if you're looking at Europe as a center, and then you know there's a Mediterranean Sea, and then the people are below it, so you can't escape that's white supremacy, right? Like you're watching entertainment that is based on the assumption of white superiority. And I think people just kind of take it and you, you consume it for so long, unless you're a person of color who says, wait, like, who am I in this? You know? And I think if you're a Mormon and you're looking at the histories and you're meant to take them literally, you're like, who am I in this? Like, I'm the bad guy. Right. So that can't be right. And so I think, you know, that's why I was never able to take it literally either. It's like, if you're taking it literally, then I'm always going to be the bad guy. And I, you know, you, your, your brain can't go there without degrading your soul. You know, um, as women too, I think if you're going to be a feminist, you have to accept the premise that women are inferior. Women are, um, you know, you say it like, oh, different roles, but really it's inferiority, you know? So um, there is male supremacy as well, you know? And this is, again, not just the Mormon church. This is, you know, this is the water we swim in is, you know, uh, sexism, racism, it's, it's everywhere. Um, but I, I do think, again, and I'm opt an optimist at heart here is that, there are more people that are opening their eyes to this. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. You know, I feel like, and this is going back to the left where I feel like we're, we're cutting down allies. Like someone will come into a group and sit and says, yeah, I'm new to feminism. And then they'll say something stupid about race. And then they just get pounded on because they're not, they don't have the right language and they don't know about cultural appropriation. They don't know about intersectionality. And here I am saying, look, I, I'll take all the allies I can get, right? If you need some time to come up with the verbiage, that's fine. But we can't be pushing these people out when there are like racists at the door wanting to cut us down, you know? So, so, something Sean said is nobody will ever get an award from a person of color for being the, the best ally. 
uh, we shouldn't be out allying each other and shaming each other for not being as good of an ally. Is that, do you share that sentiment? Yes, and I think people of color also, I think, need to be compassionate here. I mean, I, I, like speaking to maybe like what five people of color that are Mormons still and active. <laughs> look, I mean, w- um, we we've got to understand here that white people, you know, like it, you don't know what it's like to live in someone's skin, right? And so we can't expect that someone's going to be like on day one, right? Like. Un- understanding everything and willing to like, you know, shed and bow down. I mean, it's just, it's, it's human nature we're talking about, right? We got to take some humility for ourselves and, and compassion for other people. And to understand, that I don't know everything. You don't know everything, but if you want to work with me and you don't degrade me as a human being, I'm happy to work Intention- with you. Intentionally degrade, intentionally, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I'm, a, and I, you know, I tell everyone like, it's really impossible to offend me. I never get offended. And, and part of that is because I, you know, I've never, I, if, if I live my life getting offended, it would just be like one waste of time after another. Because there's constantly, I'm put in positions where, gosh, my, that was weird that they said that to my, me. Microaggressions and yeah, overt aggressions. Constant micro and overt aggressions, tons of racism. And I just, n- not that I'm always rolling it off my back. And there's like, you know, there's definitely like, you know, I have a, a hot streak. But um, I try not to be offended because it's, what good does that do anybody? Yeah. You know? I had this moment when I was doing a Mormon Stories episode on on rape and sexual assault where I, I sort of said, you know, we'll know the church is making a turn, a positive turn in this area when 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 the subject of a Sunday school lesson is on consent, right? <laughs> yeah. And the audience erupted in in applause. And yeah. I just had a similar kind of thought, which is we'll know the church is really starting to turn the corner on issues like this when there's a Sunday school lesson on privilege, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would be awesome. (laughs) And and there are probably some Sunday schools out there doing this, you know, um, Berkeley, Berkeley, Cambridge, New York. Yeah. Yeah. Part of that, but not, not generally. Right. Right. Um, Um, One quick question. Is the church, uh, locked in in the sense that the the Book of Mormon is supposed to be scripture. It's supposed to be translated God's word, the most correct book, and yet it's got encoded, explicit, racist stories. Mm-hmm. Like, is the church trapped? Because as soon as they, uh, you know, denounce or distance themselves from the fundamental narrative in the Book of Mormon, uh, it's undermining its own scripture and its own spiritual authority. And so in some ways it just feels like the church is chained to racism and can't escape racism without destroying itself. Do you, I mean, do you see that conundrum and do you see a way out of it? Yeah, I see that conundrum in, you know, in every religious text, there is this, um, you know, a play between textual formalism and, I mean, you see in the constitution, right? You could say the same thing about the founding documents with were based on slavery and white supremacy and the three fifths and the compromise. Right. So I think it's the same question we're asking as a country as religions are asking. It's, I think it's a good question. It was based on white supremacy. It was based on patriarchy. And what do we do with those texts? Do we ditch them and start new? Do we take down the Confederate documents? Do we burn them up and start over? I mean, Joseph Campbell has this great series, right? Uh, Man of a Thousand Faces and, you know, has this great Bill Moyers dialogue where he talks about like, we are, all it's of the us. power of myth, right? Power of myth. Power of myth yeah. yeah, we are all of us at this inflection point. Like we need new myths. Our old myths aren't quite working for us. We're in a different world. We're connected. We're global. We're you know, you know, our, our the gender disparities have changed, right? We don't have the same um, imperatives that we did in old times, and we need new myths. And what are those myths? Right? What are those religious understandings? What do we make of community? What do we make of tribe? Right? We're tribal by nature, and so now I think we've formed these tribes of identity identity and these tribes of belief and these tribes of, you know, uh, shared interests as opposed to like, oh, this is my tribe because this is where I was born and this is my religion because this is what was given to me. There wasn't a thought about belief when, you know, my, my dad, I asked them like, what did you believe? They're like, it wasn't even a question. Like you were Muslim because your grandma was Muslim and you just did Muslim stuff because that's who you were, you know, and it's because where you were born. And a lot of Mormons grew up that way. You're Mormon, right? And, and now I think we're in this 
you know, really confusing era, not just Mormons, Muslims too, and Buddhists and everybody. And I think we need, we need new myths and new understandings of what it's like to be a community and a tribe, because I think there's part of our DNA needs tribe. It needs other, it needs us. And I think, unfortunately, some of us are driving, uh, putting these tribes around on issues of race, um, on issues of identity. And I think we really need to fight that in our nature that says it is us and it is them. And us means, you know, progressive. And I'm going to have this purity test of what it means to be a progressive. And you can't be a progressive because you're a white man and you're a Mormon. Or you can't be a progressive because you voted for Hillary Clinton and she's a sellout or wh whatever. Or I'm, I'm white and I believe in white identity, whatever the hell that means, right? Like, or I'm, you know, any, any way that we're doing it, I think this is part of that same malaise is like we need new myths we need new things that draw us together and and i keep going back to like the 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 leaders that i admire most right martin luther king and gandhi and it's like look anyone can come on this bus but like we're going down to tear tear down jim crow we're tearing down an institution that is unjust to poor people so whoever wants to jump on this bus like go ahead i don't care who you are but we we're on a mission right so this is i mean my, my books and my scholarship tries to get at this. Look at the systems, right? Be soft on people, but be hard on these institutions of racism and sexism and, and oligarchy, right? I mean, my mom fought the Shah oligarchy. We're entering another oligarchy and it's, you know, five banks that control 80% of our assets. We've got lobbies that control Congress, right? We really, we have inequality that's only growing, right? It's hard to be poor in America now, right? And there's more poor people. There's this, you know, 1% that's out there that controls everything. And then there's all these people that have no political access or lives are harder, or wages aren't increasing, financially insecure. And so let's, let's dismantle the system. Let's not have the infighting, right? So anyone who wants to come and dismantle the system and doesn't mean, you know, we have to overthrow, I have no, no, uh, you know, I don't like revolution <laughs> because I've lived through that. But like, you know, the pragmatic efforts of like, we'll sit down with treasury and see if postal banking will work, right? Like that's, that's rewarding. And if it means that I have to work with like Hillary Clinton's, you know, supposed treasury, I'll do it. Right. And so should you, right. Because it means right. that we're going to get progress. And, and, and bring it back to religion for just a second. I, I know from, from reading your writings that you're, you're just not a fan of literalistic thinking of, of even this question of whether things are true or not. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think you care whether or not the book of Mormon is historical. You care about whether, you know, Mormons and others just live in a way that promotes social justice and kindness mm -hmm. and love, right? I think, yeah. I think that's where your heart is. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, do you ever sometimes look at the way society is going? And in some ways, I think you would agree with me that we're kind of maybe going in the wrong direction of progress right now, that maybe we're even backtracking a little bit. Mm -hmm. And do you ever feel tempted to sort of tag religion or even sometimes Mormonism a bit as being some of the social forces that are actually prohibiting the directional progress that we want. Do you have to, do you ever see that? Do you ever feel that? And do you have to fight sort of religion as being part of the problem? So, so I think this, this is complicated. I think I see religious religion as both a force of good and a force of backwardsness. And I think, I mean, again, taking this as a historical um, uh, uh, platform, right? So uh, Christianity, uh, Christ Christianity was a religion of expansion, right? So all of a sudden, it's not just the Jews and Gentiles, it's everyone, right? So this is, you know, Paul takes the gospel everywhere. And whatever the truth is of who, you know, what happens, Jesus or not, what you can say about Christianity is it was, it was expansive until it wasn't, until it was, you know, crusades, us versus them, the Roman Catholic Church, um, Islam. Islam was expansive. I mean, Muhammad wasn't trying to make a religion. He was trying to tell Jews and Christians, hey, we have the same God, right? So the Quran builds on the Torah and the Bible and says, hey, you know, we're all trading together, right? Because Mecca was this trade um, hub. And he says, we, we all have the same God. And then later on, it becomes a religion that is, you know, we're going to go and take over these lands and become exclusive. Mormonism was also a religion of expansion, right? We're going to send missionaries out and bring in the people. And 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 maybe now it's become more um, borders. So, so I think there's both. There's this expansive sense of religion. And and I think, you know, I believe there's, uh, Robert Wright wrote this great book called Non-Zero. And, you know, Karen Armstrong talks about this in Fields of Blood like religion you know you, you religion has been um you know we go from non-zero so or, or zero sum interactions like us versus them and then anytime we can find a non-zero interaction right so we can 
win-win, then that's an expansive thing. And so religion, I think, has been shown the way to not non-zero-ness, right? Christ's whole message was like expansion. We can be more tolerant. We can accept our enemies and we can, you know, make this more expansive and everybody wins, you know, and Islam started that way. So I think these memes, if you follow the memes, right, they tend to be expansive. And, and this is what I'm saying. We need new myths because these memes maybe aren't working for us anymore. They're contracting. And so I don't know if we're going backwards or this is a momentarily momentary lapse. I, I think that the meme that we got to follow is, are we going to a more expansive community or are we going to more restrictive? And I think we can't help but go to more expansive. We are increasingly bound with each other. I mean, we've got to deal with climate change. We've got to deal with global inequality. We've got to deal with terrorism that's no longer contained in certain places, right? It's going to come get you wherever you are. And so increasingly, we understand that we've got to rely on each other. And so religion, I think, can choose to be a force for good or a force for retrenchment. And I think there are those who take religion and, and lead them, you know, Brian Stevenson is one of my heroes. And he was in your favorite 13th movie. He was my law professor at NYU. Brian Stevenson is this death penalty guy. And he's a Christian, right? So his Christian faith has led him to fight for death penalty, um, you know, convicts. And I know Mormons whose Mormon faith has led them to be social activists and go do this good work. And I know both, you know, there's evangelicals like this Austin guy, right? Doesn't open his church and he's this prosperity gospel, right? These, you know, uh, Mormons. Joel, Joel Osteen. Joe Olstein, right? And then these Mormons who, you know, uh, take their religion as, uh, you know, a, a, a retraction, right? It's us and them, right? So you can use uh, religion, and, and there's both in the text. So I think both the Book of Mormon and the Bible have both traditions within them. And I think this is where you, you know, depending on how you are, how much fear you have in your life, right? And I think it is that it comes to fear. I think a lot of people are afraid now of the future. And I'm one of these people who are like, you know, plot me in the future. I think the future is going to be better. And I think some, some people uh, are afraid of what's coming and, and want to retain the past and, and are true sort of traditionalists. They want to keep what's theirs and they don't want to risk what, what might happen around the corner. And this is, I think, the, the tension that every religious person goes through is do I want to just hold on to the past or do I want to ex accelerate toward the future? And I think we're, we're struggling with that right now. And as a final line of questioning just on Mormonism and racism, as this Mormon mommy blogger comes out promoting white culture, uh, you know, what some would say is white supremacy, the church gave an initial response and then they gave a follow-up response. Mm -hmm. Did, do you have any sort of takeaways from that whole exchange? Was that yeah, encouraging, discouraging? What was that for you? I followed it all. I mean, I cannot believe that we are dealing with white supremacy. I mean, like, I can't, like, you know, when I book, when I started writing my book, like, eight years ago, I'm like, hey, we're talking about the wealth gap, and, you know, it's going to be this nuanced policy take, and all of a sudden, it's coming out, and we're dealing with, like, the Klan? Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? So, you know, I started, I might just stumbled on this woman's Twitter feed, and I just, like, I couldn't believe it, right? And I, I couldn't, you know, um... I, I couldn't square that with what I knew. But then again, it, again, it's always been there. Like I, you know, I, I feel that, right? Like I have pr preservation. And, and here's the thing, right? When she's saying like my white babies and I want to preserve my white culture. And this is why I brought up the dating issue because I've, I felt that at BYU. I felt like, you know, the, this whole intermarriage thing is like, you don't want to um, dirty up your line by some brown race. And, and that wasn't explicit. It was implicit. It was felt. So that's always been there. And it's nice to feel, to see the church coming out against it. I wish they would come out very strongly against interracial marriage because that I think is the heart. In favor, against. In favor, against those who say that it is not doctor. Of course, yes. I'm in favor of interracial marriage because I think that is a heart of white supremacy too. Like, why would you not condone that, right? Why, why would you um, be opposed to interracial marriage unless you believed in race? And if you believe in race, then then you believe in racial purity and you believe in white supremacy. And so I think, you know, we all have to take race as, as a fiction. I don't believe that there's any sort of biological uh, superiority or inferiority, I think is what we see. And so marry who you want, have kids that are mixed race. I mean, my kids are Mexican, Iranian, whatever, and they're beautiful kids, you know, and, and there's, you know, nothing muddied up about their line. Um, they're fine, right? And, and so an explicit pronouncement in support of mixed mixed race marriages would be a positive step for you i would love that okay and did the church's second response to the to the white supremacist mommy blogger it, 
was that encouraging to you at all? Was yes. that a yes? It was, you know, it was, and it was. Um, it, it, harken back to the uh, brother Bot thing. Do you remember Bot? Yeah, Randy absolutely, Bott. Randy Bot. Yeah, yeah. I so think Randy Bot was uh, one of my religion professors at BYU, and I, I, I hated that guy. <laughs> Just to be honest, like I was in his class at DNC, and it was so offensive, it was sexist, racist, you know, everyone just ate it up. And I went to the dean to complain about him. And I just like had like, it was like on a crusade to like, you know, like tell people why this guy was problematic. I mean, he was really problematic. And he came out early in Mitt Romney running a while back saying, you know, the blacks and the priesthood explaining it away as like Cain and whatever, like he had some like theory in the church came out and slapped him on the hand with that, you know, and was like, that is not what we believe. And that made me really happy. So I love when they come out and say this stuff. And it was political at the time because I think they were like getting Romney's back against this like crazy quack. And so I think they will do that on occasion. I, I you know, and I appreciate it. And I, I understand that the church is a hierarchy. It's a corporation. So these statements are hard. I don't sort of hang my life on these statements. I don't, I know how hard it is for an institution to make a statement. So whatever. So I, I appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I, I also think that it's important for members to just come out and, and, and say what they believe and what they don't believe. So I do, you know, as allies appreciate that, um, what the church says or doesn't, um, I think that's, I guess that's important, right? Cause there's a lot of members who just listen to what the church says and if they don't say anything, then they don't think it's important. Right. Well, I guess that that's going to be, did the church's essay on, on blacks and the priesthood make you feel better or worse? Um, yeah, I mean, again, I wish I'd had it when I was 16 and that guy was like, <laughs> told me about Black Slave Priesthood and I was just like punched in the gut and not, and there was nothing from the church at the time, right? So I lived, you know, in college and we were, you know, listening to Eugene England telling us about it, but, you know, I had no explanation. So I guess it's more helpful now. I mean, I think we just need to be really honest and say it was a mistake. We were all racist back then and it was not a revelation in any way, shape or form. We just screwed up and we fixed it it was way too late to fix it um so sorry <laughs> yeah all right okay so we can check off the box of mormons and racism so we can move on yeah. to the next topic now uh mormons and social justice now i'm going to just tell you when i first started my podcast i'm going to embarrass my mom here she probably won't listen all the way to this because it's one of the longer ones and she's uh She's not always able to go the, the distance on some of my interviews, bless her heart. But I remember when I was doing Mormon stories, for me, I felt very motivated by sympathies of, for, for women, LGBT people, people of color. Like for me, Mormon stories has pretty much always been an act of social activism in, 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 you know, in my mind, at least, uh, in my motives. And my mom just, one time she said to me, why would you ever want to be an activist? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, mom, that's like Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Like, aren't yeah. those the people we respect most? And she's like, yeah, yeah but the life of an, like, look what happened. Look what yeah. happened to them both, right? Yeah. She's like, that's just not a life. It's just not, yeah. and it's not just that they were killed. It's just like, yeah. it's a cruddy family life. It's, yeah. it's a life of always being angry. It's a life yeah. of always mm -hmm. speaking out and protesting. And, and she's yeah. just like, that's no life. And I just think that's, that's kind of Mormon culture. It's like, yeah. we are not, we are, we are, we are, you know, activism is an anathema to sort of conservative Orthodox Mormonism. Oh, yeah, so, Joseph Smith was an activist. No, no, I know, I know. So let's talk about that. Some would say yeah. Mormonism and social justice are oxymorons, right? They, mm -hmm. They're two things that don't belong together. Talk mm -hmm. about why you would even want to talk about it and what it means to you. Yeah. You know, and, why, and why we're not aware of our own heritage. Yeah, I mean, so I grew up. I grew up in a very different house, right? We we were we were activists because what it meant, what activism meant, is if you see things that are wrong and you don't do it, then you're a coward. You know, you don't change things. And I gotta say, I mean, you you really have been so instrumental in opening up this progressive conversation. So I, you know, thank you from you know uh, someone who was a uh, you know BYU felt alone in you know in in these feminist groups and these pro gay groups. I and mean, we were, you know meeting in like the basement like we got defunded in voice right and so all of a sudden now you have a podcast like it's global you know it's it's all over and so i i, I appreciate that and why weren't you around when i was in college you know? <laughs> <laughs> no i mean I, I really do i mean you've given people a platform and i've you know um uh through your position and I, you know i think um onto your question i think it's a very very good one i think it's there i think if you 
if you are activist minded and if you search the scriptures and if you look and I'm on my mission, I read the Book of Mormon like 15 times, right? I read the Bible, the New Testament, like a bunch of times. It's all there. I mean, what, what was I, Jesus if he wasn't a social justice warrior? Yeah, exactly. Like right? you have not read the New Testament. And, and right, if you don't agree with inequality, right? Like Jesus was a socialist, right? <laughs> I mean, forget the, 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 the political socialism, but this idea that like the poor shall be first, right? That the rich cannot enter the kingdom of God. You know, and I don't want to talk about policy here. I don't want to talk about politics. I just mean this idea that like poor people deserve dignity, right? That poor people um, deserve equality, right? Not, not that everyone gets to be rich, but some people don't get to have all the gold and then make all the rules so that prohibits all the people, other people from having the gold, right? This is Jesus' whole mission. Jesus was an activist. Jesus was a progressive activist, right? And I think these words have lost their meaning, but what Jesus, I think, meant of it was, you know, uh, it's, it, there are people who take their positions of power and they oppress um, those who are weak. And let's not do that, you know? And I think that's what being an activist is. is like, who are the people right now who are abusing their power over others? And, and let's join a coalition of people who can fix that, right? Because those things can be fixed, right? You, you, you can't maintain, this is Martin Luther King Gandhi, right? Like power won't give unless it's taken from them, right? And the way that it can be power taken- Power never relinqu relinquishes itself voluntarily. It must be forced. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is, um, and power, power will take unto its own. Power will accumulate. Capital will take more and more and more. And this is, you know, capital by Thomas Piketty, right? Like capital's going to grow. That's all capital wants to do. So if you're rich, you're going to maintain that riches, right? There was this study that came out today, like 42% of Harvard's entering class are legacy, right? Um, so that's, you know, uh, people who are rich, their kids will be rich, you know? And I'm saying this now as part of the upper middle class, right? I make great money. My kids are going to be set up. And I think that there's some unfairness that where you're born and who you're born to, that if you're born in India, if you're born in Bangladesh, you just don't get to have the life, you know, um, that you do if you're born in New York City to someone rich, you know? And not that everyone, like, has to have the same cars and same fancy stuff, but can we live without a little bit of our fancy stuff so that someone else can just feel food secure, you know, or have shelter. And I think we have just wide disparities of outcomes. And I, I don't like that we live in that world and it bothers me. It hurts my soul, you know, and I think um, it should, as you know, if you believe in God or if you don't believe in God, if you just believe in humanity, I think it's got to hurt your soul because, you know, like the Rawlsian, you know, veil of ignorance, like you got to imagine that another in another iteration, it could be you. And if you can't see that that could be you, and through no fault of your own, you would be poor and succumb to violence and rape and whatever, then you don't have enough empathy. And, and I think that's, that's a, a flaw and religion should teach you at least that. And so when you think about, uh, let's just say the past 10 years, there I can think of a few Mormons who have sprung up trying to sort of lead uh, some some sort of strains of activism. I, ordained women comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there have been there have been several people trying to be advocates for LGBT people, mm -hmm. um, and there, there's two things that are kind of outrageous about that. One is how um, how the church reacted, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what's also crazy is is to think about how much time and money and words the church has spent on trying to prevent same-sex marriage, for example. It's unbelievable. And, and being silent on issues like war and poverty and the prison system and the inequities there. So talk about both. So first, what was it like for you to watch ordained women struck down, to watch people who tried to advocate for LGBT people be shut down, to see the, the November um, you know, 2015 policy, what's it been like for you to see the church kind of not only not be social justice advocates, but to strike down many of those who tried to become that? What was that like um, for you? Really disheartening. I mean, really, really, I mean, of all of the issues that you could fight for, I mean, really prohibiting gay marriage? Like, I mean, I, there are, I mean, I, I have always believed that, you know, uh, God loves gays as much as, I mean, if not more than he loves me, right? Like, I mean, I, I think it's uh, 
just, I have never, ever had an issue with it. I can't imagine having an issue with it. But putting that aside, even if you do have an issue with it, right? I can't imagine that that ranks anywhere near the top resource-wise, like you said, to put the money and the resources to go out there and fight against this thing. Like, like you said, we have war and power. I know, right? Like I, I've been there. We've got Mormons, right? People in the church who live in, in poor areas and uh, in war-torn areas, right? We've got women who can't leave their abusive, you know, spouses, right? Because they're being, you know, uh, they're in these communities where it's okay, right? We've got tons and tons of real problems. And, and this is the thing you're focusing on. And the ordained women, like I, I was... I was blown away when Kay Kelly um, got, and you got excommunicated. I just couldn't believe that the church would do that. I mean, I really, it, it was, it was hard on me personally, um, both of those, um, I think. And I followed them very carefully. Um, I, I knew of Kay Kelly. I didn't know her personally. And, and same with you. And, and, you know, believe me, there was a lot of us out there who just like wept in our homes. Um, not publicly. I've never really had a public Mormon persona per se. Um, but it was a huge shock to my uh, connection with the church. And that, to be honest, is when I felt like, ah, oh, maybe this is not my community anymore. Um, and, you know, I, um, I, I wish that, that it could be different, but the, the way that the church has taken the gay marriage and the, the feminism stuff, I mean, ordained women, like, <sighs> It, it seemed obvious. I mean, it was funny. My dad, I talked to him. My dad doesn't know anything about Mormonism, you know, and I was kind of sitting around and talking to him and I was like, yeah, there's this group of women who are asking for the priesthood. He's like, yeah, why wouldn't they get the priesthood? And, and I'm just like, well, sure, you know, not only that, but get this, like, <laughs> you know, um, and, and here is this man who grew up like a uh, Shiite Muslim in the most backward region of a backward country. And he's like, well, of course women should get the priesthood. Like, what do you mean? You know? And you know, um, and, and you know, oh, I want to meet your parents. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they're just unassuming people, but have you know, and 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 to be honest, I mean, my parents are hard on gay marriage. Like they don't, they're of a different generation, and so I think that that I think they're not comfortable with, right? Um, but but they're older, and that's you know, uh, they grew up Shia, and and but but they're also very much like you, you do whatever needs to happen, you know, and I, I just think they they're more uncomfortable with it than, than, than our generation is. But like, I, you know, it's, it's one of these things where um, it is, there are real evils out there and there are real um, problems and there's real suffering and two men or two women getting married doesn't even come close to causing any real suffering. Give us, give us off the top of your head, 10 really significant problems that should be, Obviously, a higher priority than maybe some of the other things that we're focusing on. Give us ten. I know. I know it seems obvious to you, but let's name some. Let's okay. name some of the biggest. Okay. Um, one. Um, uh, poverty. I mean, worldwide poverty. Uh, American poverty. Right. American poverty. Right. We've got huge, huge pockets of poverty. One. Two. Climate change. Right. Like, you, we can do stuff. We can recycle. We can, you know, reduce carbon footprints. We can, you know, be um, lowering our uh, carbon excess. Right. This is if you're a conservative. If you believe that the earth was created by God, then you would want to preserve it, right? You would want, you would see the environmental degradation as a worse sort of sin to God than gay marriage. Um, three, um, you know, uh, women are still like uh, half the sky, beat. half yeah. the sky, right? Yeah, we're still getting, you know, uh, not me personally, but like beaten and abused and trafficking and, and trafficked and the sex slavery and like the church could like eliminate that, you know, with the money that they spent on Prop 8, like could we just go to Thailand and rescue some of these girls from prostitution, you know, and slavery? Um, I don't know where I was, four or five, um, five, uh, you know, credit. Um Let's start a fund where um, members or non-members, if they have an emergency that comes up, like a medical uh, emergency, they can get $500 instead of going to a payday lender and having to pay like 2,000% interest that ends up sinking them into debt, right? Um, six, childcare, right? For poor people. Again, yeah, most of my things are poverty. We don't have, let's come up with a system of childcare. So a woman who is a single mom, right? 40% of uh, single moms are poor. Right. So let's give them childcare so they can go to work. You know, that's a system of volunteers easily take care of that. Right. Um, children who are not, they're, they're not getting fed or they're not getting fed the right things. Like come up with the lunches, like that school lunch thing in Utah, right. That woman who trucked the thing. I'm like, just let's pay for their 
everyone gets free lunch. Like everyone gets free breakfast and free lunch. Just take all the money because these are kids, right? If you're, even if you're a libertarian, like poor people deserve their fate, like surely that can't apply to children. Why should children be living in poverty? Like there's just, you know, there's no system that is a, a, a philosophical or economic philosophy that should allow for that, right? Um, education, right? We've got people who are going to struggling schools that cannot learn. You know, we tutor some kids in Harlem who um, sent them to BYU, uh, kids who got, you know, in Harlem schools, straight A. So they did everything the school required of them, couldn't read. So they couldn't succeed in college because they had done everything the school system required of them, but they didn't have the skills to succeed in college. So we sent a couple of them to BYU Idaho and they just couldn't make it, you know, but let's put in money to these inner city schools, right? If you believe in education, if you believe in like, you know, pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, let's give these kids bootstraps, right? Um, shelter, right? Homelessness, right? Um, Utah's done great in this, but let's like fix it in other cities, Um I can't remember where else I was. I mean, like, you know, uh, natural disasters, right? Let's just come up with a fund where we go in and, and Mormons do, do, do this, but there's natural disasters abroad that are constant, you know, um, refugees, you know, uh, there are refugees who through no fault of their own, like my family could not live in the system that they were in. And they are now pushed into another country and like, can, can we accept them? Can we bring them in and make them feel welcome? And some Mormons, I think, do do this. I've seen a lot of good work done here. But like, if you believe in the gospel, if you believe in the Good Samaritan story, if you believe in what Jesus said, like, you're going to open up your door to refugees. So I don't know if that's 10 or not. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Keep going. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking poverty, poverty, poverty. But then I think about what was Jesus always talking about, right? Poverty, poverty, poverty. <laughs> that's, all, right. that's all Jesus talked about. It's like, if you look at the Maslow's chart, right? Like, we can't get to self-actualization without dealing with poverty you know and i think you know get, you know even though with the lgbtq stuff like i think that right like let them do that forget that you guys there are people who can't eat you know like why are we focused on who someone is gonna love right let like who cares i, I, I literally i can't even summon up the energy to care about who someone loves i i just it, there are no victims here there are no victims so what let's just say there there's some there's some people listening. Marissa, you're brilliant. I love this. I'm an active believing Mormon. And what do I do in 2017? How can I be, how can I be an activist amongst my people in a way where I won't get struck down in a way where I can have a chance of making some meaningful difference? What would you, do you have any ideas about what Mormon social justice activism might look like in 2017? Sure. If you're an activist Mormon, first of all, why are you listening to John Malin? I think that guy got excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think that we do have Orthodox listeners. We do. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I consider myself, you know, um, uh, was, you know, active at some point. Um, I, I think, you know, um, just focus on, focus on the things that matter and, and you can do it at church, you know, like raise your hand when someone says something really stupid in Sunday school, raise your hand and say something smart and nuanced, right? When someone tries to, you know, uh, lead the church in some way, speak up, right? It's like those people within that really do the best, best work and of, of, of shaping where the church is going to go speak up. Don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid of the social, you know, stigma because what you're saying is true, right? If you, if you are out there speaking up for the poor and disenfranchised, like you're, you're doing the right thing, you know? And I think read the new Testament, read the new Testament a bunch of times in a row and tell, tell me what the message of that book is. Cause I think if you really like sit with the new Testament and read it, you cannot but to come out with a message that like we've got to do more uh, for injustices in society. Um, and if you don't come out with that message, like email me and tell me what other thing Jesus was talking about. If not that. I love it. Uh, this is great. Um, all right. So we're going to check the box on, on Mormons and social justice. We've solved those problems. Uh, Niles writes, I love everything about this discussion with a heart. Niles, uh, Niles and I were buddies. His older brother was, uh, a close friend of mine for many years. Um, was it, which now was his last name? Watterson? Niles Watterson, yeah. Oh yeah, his um, wife was my BYU roommate freshman year. Freaking. Oh cool, yeah, she's yeah. Canadian, right? Yeah, Canadian. Uh, no, Denver, Canada, uh, Colorado. Brecken? Oh, uh, I we think they're, they're definitely in Colorado now. Yeah, for sure. Oh okay. Shalama writes, or read the New Testament, but the Synoptics more than John. So I, that's a little tip. Sure. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Shalama also writes, so Mirsa, what's this picture of a toddler chewing on the tip of a sharp kitchen knife? <laughs> it's what plastic. <laughs> oh, okay. it's, it's plastic. Okay. Uh, this is my daughter, Lucia, when she was two, she'd go around, she had this like little pirate knife. She'd be like, oh, this is my profile picture because it looks like I'm a negligent parent. And so that's, I guess, maybe the image I've, my subconscious wants to send to the world. It's a plastic knife. Um, Al writes, the problem is that many talk about Jesus, but few follow the examples of his actions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Becca writes, this chick, I hope, I hope you're okay with her referring okay. to you as a chick. I, you you can't be offended. So I'm not offended. <laughs> Becca says, this chick has got an awesome way of explaining how I have felt ever since I've had my own exodus from my original tribe. Love her. So, uh, love you, chick. what's that? I love her, chick. All right. Uh, G. Frias writes, straight talk. I love it. Uh, Danielle writes, can this podcast last forever? I'm learning so much. Well, Mormon Stories podcasts do come close to lasting forever. <laughs> so you're in, you're in good, uh, you're in good uh, company, nice. Danielle. All right. Um, so we've got a final topic that we want to talk about before maybe we do a few wrap-up questions. Thank you so much for everything so far for your time. I know your time is precious, so this means a lot. Um, you, you, you wanted to talk about tribalism and Mormon identity. Mm -hmm. I did read your Sunstone talk and mm -hmm. why tribalism? Why is this an important topic to you? And mm -hmm. what do you have to say about tribalism and Mormonism? Yeah. So, so I think, look, um, this is, I mean, goes back to what we were saying before is when, when people are leaving the church or they're not quite satisfied with it, they, they still long for this tribe of, of people who think like that. Right. And so increasingly, I think we're identifying ourselves with these labels. Like I am a progressive post Mormon activist, whatever. And, and we box ourselves in with these things. Right. And I think you know, part of like the solid Mormon identity, if you're going into, you know, true Mormon believer, um, I've always sort of, you know, um, I, as I said in my Sunstone talk, I've always envied, you know, these women. I mean, I'm a woman, so I, you know, look at women as my, uh, you know, peers. And I, there's all these great Mormon women who are just so lovely and, 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 um, uh, you know, good people and who just knew what their life was going to be, right? I'm going to be a wife and a mom and I'm going to have a house. And, you know, I, I envied them, you know, and, and as I've grown up um, and I never was able to feel that way because I just, I had such a scattered different childhood and I never, you know, had anything real that I could say, like, well, this is what my life is going to be because I don't even, you know, I had never had any solid structure. And, but, but I have realized over time that these um, images that we create, these identities, let's call them, are, you know, we, we draw these circles around ourselves and we're saying, this is my identity, but everything outside of it, you end up fearing, right? So I, you know, I call it, you know, in the Sunstone talk, I talk about these landmines that we put in these borders around our identity. And so there's things that you can't think, you know, there's things that you can't say, there's things that you can't see, you know? And so as long as you protect yourself and you stay in, that's solid and that's comfortable and that's your identity, but don't go too close to the border and certainly don't step outside of it. And, you know, I, you know, the, the, the good thing about me never having a tribe of belonging is that I've also never had these, you know, barriers on where I could think and what I could what kind of ideas I could harbor. And so I've always felt intellectually curious and I've always felt like I could allow my curiosity to take me to where it wanted. Like, you know, questioning God or questioning religion or questioning the literal belief of anything, but also questioning like, you know, what does it mean to, to have a, a well-meaning life and, and really letting myself, um, you know, scratch the boundaries and not fear what's, what lays beyond. And certainly I have fears that govern my life, right? And part of that is like, you know, being a refugee and war and all that stuff. And, and, and there are sort of um, those kind of fears, but the fears aren't, of identity. And so this is where I think um, I see sometimes, and you know, I've pissed off maybe your Trump supporters and maybe I'll piss off the left now. Um, is I see in the left, um, in, in this is the, you know, the, the, um, on, on the internet, sort of the, the progressive um, spheres is that we're, um, we're so tribalistic. We're, we're, we're not compassionate toward each other. We, you know, I see this in the, in, you know, the, the blogs that I'm part of is people just are harsh about it. And it, it's very much like this, you know, litmus test. And, and it's this, if you're not saying the right things, you're not doing the right things. If you're don't believe the right things, right? Like if you believe this, you can't possibly be my friend. If you voted for Donald Trump then you're dead to me, if you're a white man who doesn't have black lives matter, 
that are tattooed on your forehead, then you don't, you, you don't see me. Right. And I, and look, I get it. Like black lives matter makes sense. White lives matter doesn't make sense. Right. But I'm happy to talk about that. And if you don't get that right away, like I'm comfortable that I'm able, I'm, I'm, you know, we, we, we can talk through it and it's going to be um, a fruitful conversation. And I think there's a lot of fear that happens in these communities where they, they, they resort to like, you're offensive to me, right? Like I, and I've seen it, like if someone will say something and they're like, well, you're a white guy, so you can't say that. Or you're, you know, this, you've never experienced that. And that, that's true. Like as a white guy, you have never experienced what it's like to fear, you know, rape, right? Or to, to, to be a woman of color and whatever. But, you know, I have faith in the human experience that I could, we could dialogue and get there, you know? And I think we often write people off. And part of this is maybe like post-traumatic stress, right? Like we were part of a clan and there was all of these beliefs and these check boxes. And now we've recreated them outside the church, right? We've recreated them in progressive communities where if you don't believe these things that you don't belong, you know? And I, and I, I just want us to approach each other with a bit more compassion and a bit more um, like giving people some time to get there. Um, and I think everyone's on a different uh, timeline. And I, I've seen a lot of infighting that I just feel like is, is a waste of time. Like, let's just, you know, work together. And I feel confident enough in the cause um, that people will come to it, that we don't have to like shame them. Because I think a lot of this tribalism is it rests on shame. What about, what about the discussions of, I mean, you, you, you gave the Elaine de Bouton uh, mm -hmm. quote about there's a, there's no less interesting question than whether or not religion is true. Um, let me, let me push back on that, not in a serious way, but just in, in, for the mm -hmm. matter of exploring. There's a lot of people who feel like they would have made very, very different choices in their life if they had been given all the information and if the church actually turned out to be what it claimed to be. And so when people talk about the truth claims and they talk about uh, the literality and all this stuff. I know that from an intellectual perspective, even from a social justice perspective, those conversations are like the tinkling of brass. Mm -hmm. However, to the people who feel like significant parts of their life or their time or their money were in, in a sense robbed from them mm -hmm. because they weren't given all the information and because uh, they would have made very different decisions in a different situation. The woman who would have gone and got her education instead of becoming a mom with six kids and now she's divorced because her husband was a, was a louse and she married because her mission president said, go get married or, or the LGBT person that was put, you know, into reparative therapy and had 10 or 15 years of torment and mm -hmm. self-torture, um, you know, to people like that, uh, you know, uh, the fact whether or not it's true or not actually really mattered quite a bit. How yeah. would you, how would you speak to those sorts of concerns um, as you also bring up these important points about what really matters? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have a lot of compassion for that. And I have a lot of friends in that camp. And I, I don't think, I, I see this as two different discussions. I, you know, I think, um, absolutely. If, if you, I, I feel for that a lot, you know, um, and, and, and this goes, you know, this is broad, you right. I mean, um, I think Stephen Peck writes in the road, less traveled, like at, at one point, everyone has to leave sort of the dogma of their parents and create their own religion. So I think there is this, you know, sense of like killing your father, the Freudian, like you, you come out and you, you, you have to, um, set your own life path. And so I think part of that is just natural and um, everyone goes through it. Everyone has to dismantle the dogma of their parents. And in the Mormon context, it just so happened that, yes, maybe there were decisions made resting on that dogma. And so I, I, I feel so sad for those people that, that really do feel like there's a sense of regret. Um, but so you're also so, saying that's part of the human experience, Mormon or not. Um, that's, that's kind of maturity you're saying. I think that's part of maturity is like um, just taking the blinders off and seeing. And, and I also think, you know, um, uh, the, the abyss, you know, this idea of um, nothingness and, and no godness, that's not comforting either. So I, you know, I often wonder, like, it's like the matrix, right? Do you take the red pill or the blue pill? And so, so I, I don't know, like, as far as like happiness, maybe, I don't know which pill is the one that like is staying in maybe you're better off. Blue pill. Blue pill is staying <laughs> Blue in. Blue pill is staying in. You know, and, and so, so some of us, you know, I think um, want truth, you know, and the way Alama de, de Bataan says, I, I, I want to be clear, is like, 
he says like, look, religions have taken all the good parts of sort of community and songs music and, and art yeah, so there's all of these great things like why can't people who aren't believers in a religion also adopt those things and so i think this is a, that he's talking about a very different thing i think he is not saying like you should believe in anything literally and i do i think it's it is destructive um to teach children uh literal beliefs and and teach them shame and sin and hell and i i feel i i think that is uh, abusive um in any religion and i think that is is hard and i think it's not it could happen in any religion it happens in islam right um you you will go to hell if you show your hair you will go to hell if you you know have sex before marriage and and so people make these decisions based on that and i think that is truly tragic and i think it is you know even it is a sense of abuse and, and it's funny uh, i think um uh frederick Douglass said something like it you know he saw um when um white when white people um would teach their kids white supremacy. He saw that as a form of abuse, like teaching anyone that they're better than anyone else. He saw that as abusive to the, uh, you know, slaveholder, right? And he saw how slaveholding changed somebody into someone despicable, from someone humane to someone despicable. And I think that idea of the devil and sin and, you know, literal hell, that, that, can mess you up. Um, so I, I do feel sad because I, 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 I didn't, I never uh, experienced that in a literal way. I, I had it taught to me, um, but it bounced off um, luckily. Um, and so I, I have a lot of compassion, but, but again, I want to say that, that, that is broad religious, that is pan religious. Um, it can also be pan other things, right? There's a lot of shame that, that we give people outside of religion. The religion does have a lock on some of that hell and sin stuff. So I feel I do feel for that. Um, so, so what advice would you give, let's say questioning or liberal or even post Mormons mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they may lose sight of what's most important in terms of this, this issue of identity and tribalism? Um, I just think don't use the tools of the oppressor. Like if you were taught that, you know, the other is bad and evil, try to not think in that way, you know, um, see people as we're all a little bit broken. We're all sort of grasping for something. We all just want to be loved and seen and appreciated. And, you know, we don't want to be told that we're racist or awful and we're going to react. Or dumb to or ignorant or foolish. Ignorant. And even those in the church, like when people leave the church and they're like, oh, you're deluded and duped, like that, that is not helpful, you know? Um, so, so treat people like, like they're people, like they're humans that have the, the same sort of, you know, way, ways of working as you do. And, and I think it's that sort of empathy and compassion, again, coming back to this idea of like, just, just try to think what it's like to be them uh, and not you. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and we're, we're all a little bit short here on this because we can only know what it's like to be us, but we've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. And, and I, it's hard, right? Cause like, I think Trump is, he, you know, I think he's, he's destructive and he's a narcissist, but also I see in Trump, like he wants to be loved and he wants to be appreciated and he wants to be like cheered and he hasn't evolved past that. Like, I think he's just, this like, man baby you know but but he is a baby like i think there's this part of him that just wants attention you know and and there's part of all of us that's like that right and so i think you know um not, not to, like you shouldn't vote for trump right don't do that but <laughs> <laughs> but but understanding that maybe like he's maybe not the devil incarnate he's just like a broken human being you know that got a lot too much power jennifer writes we are all just walking each other home right Right. Just, yeah. And then let's, let's even, you know, even the people that you consider to be that other, whether it's a Muslim refugee who don't, you don't want in your country and whether it's a true believing Mormon white Bishop, like we're all a little bit broken and we all have soft spots and we're all trying to do the best we can. Some of, them, some of us are it. trying harder than others, I guess. Right. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. Uh, what do you want to say? What do you want to say first of all about your, let's just say, religious or spiritual beliefs? Uh, you know, God, Jesus, universalism. Where you know what? If you were to sort of state some of the tenets of your beliefs these days, what would be some of the things you would you would talk about or <sighs> assert? Um, and it doesn't have to be religious. It can be yeah. just principles or values yeah um 
I, I believe, oof, um, again, I don't, um, I believe, you know, I believe in evolution a hundred percent. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, that's an interesting place to start. <laughs> I, I believe I believe in that that science. I, I believe in the things that we've proven. I believe that um, we've got a lot to study about the human brain. Um, I believe that um, you know meditation and mindfulness. I, you know, I, I believe that you know uh, getting control of our thoughts is is really important. I believe that our brains are not the best indicators. Our thoughts and feelings aren't always to be trusted here. You know, I think, um, I, 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 I do believe in magic. I do believe that, you know, there's, uh, we need to have some humility in what we say we believe, all of us, like including the hard scientists who say there is no God. It's like what Louis C.K. said. It's like, have you looked in the basement bathroom? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I don't know but I, I, I'm getting to be okay with not knowing. I don't think, you know, I don't, I, I, there's a lot of things I don't think, like I don't think, I don't believe in heaven and hell and all of this stuff. I don't know if I even believe that there is anything after we die, but I'm, I'm okay with not knowing, you know, and I'm going to try to live the best life I can live here. Um, and, I, and I think that's the thing. If, if I believed in just death at death, I still don't think in, it would lead me to eat, drink, and be merry. I still want to leave the world better than how I came into it. And I want to raise children who are good, ethical, kind, moral beings, you know, um, because I think that I believe in humanity and I believe in progress. I think there are, we have taken some steps back, but I do believe that we are getting better together. Um, but the future is not certain. I do believe in that. I do believe in climate change. And I do believe that we, we are using more than, um, that, w that the earth can give us. And, and so I think, um, you know, but, but I think we, um, we, I also believe that we need new myths. We need new, um, uh, uh understandings of each other. We need, um, you know, if you want to shed our religion, we've got to find something else that gives us that belonging and that, uh, that, you know, putting, you know, not like, uh, living just for yourself. Like we've got to learn how to live for other people, worship something other than our own lives. Because I think if we worship ourselves, it will eat ourselves up. This is the D David Foster Wallace quote, right? Like if anything that you, if you worship your money or your looks or your power, it will eat you alive. And so you've got to worship something else, whether it's a cause or whether it's a, you know, um, a group of people that you want to help, right? Find something that is outward looking and, and dedicate your life to that because otherwise you're going to swallow yourself whole with, you know, whatever power, you know, greed, whatever. What are you comfortable sharing sort of about your relationship with the church now and what that's like for you to be where you are? Knowing that the church was a really important part of your family's upbringing um, and your family's history in the United States. I mean, you really can't separate mm -hmm. Mormonism from your family's sort of ascent uh, in, in the United States. So, no, Mormonism was America. To, I was like, it took me a long time to figure out that Americans like didn't think, like thought Mormons were weird because we got to America and the Mormons came and they're like, welcome to America, you know? So we thought it was like part and parcel and it took a while to be like, oh, like Mormons are actually weird here. <laughs> <You> <laughs> know? Um, I, I think um, I miss, I miss the church. I, I you know, uh, this, uh, we've struggled here in this ward and um, it's been a while. I miss my Harlem ward a lot. I miss my New York wards. Um, and I, I do miss my friends in the church and I, I, um, I can see myself, you know, coming back into it, you know, and the way that I've always done is like, I, you know, I have my own stuff swirling around in my head and, and my own beliefs, but um, I miss the community, you know? Um, uh, so I hope that, you know, I, I, I can find sure, but, but it became difficult. It became difficult as, you know, um, I felt like, mostly for my children, they were learning stuff that I didn't, it was not making them better people. And I thought that, you know, um, I can't, I, I, I can't just keep like coming home and saying, no, 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 that's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Let's just like, you know, take, take a break. Um, and we've tried some other, um, different communities and, you know, um, now, you know, I've read the really, I've read a lot of books in Buddhism lately and, um, and I've tried meditation and I think that's, not Buddhism, you know, belief wise, but Buddhism practically, right? Because I'm a, a very practically minded person. And I think there's so much good in meditation and just 
calming yourself and getting getting some distance from your beliefs and thoughts. And I think we all need that. Like we all need a little bit of, you know, like a, a barrier between where our brain wants us to go, and where our bodies want us to go is, and to where like the calm center is. Sounds like you, you miss your Mormon community a bit like I do. Yeah. You miss it too? Oh yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. I, I always loved going to church. Yeah, me too. For the people and the music yeah. and the culture. Like, it was never, I, I was, I was active until they kicked me out basically. Um, yeah. mm. So do you, do you still in some ways identify Mormon? If somebody, if somebody said to you, oh, you want to be, well, you're you Mormon. Like, what do you say? And do you think, Probably. do you think you can be, <laughs> you can claim, you know, some like to say we need to, there's lots of ways to Mormon and we need to claim our Mormonism, even if it's unorthodox. Are you at that point where you can claim Mormonism still as part um, of your core identity or? It was hard for me always. I mean, I was never, it wasn't my identity, you know, because I, um, I, I, I never felt like a true Mormon because I wasn't a pioneer Mormon. I was a convert and I was a Muslim and, and you know, a uh, uh, Iranian and, and, and we never, like, even when we were active Mormons, I never felt like Mormon Mormon. And so even when people asked me then, I was like, well, kind of, you know, and I never was like a, believe it all Mormon. And so I, you know, I, I say it's complicated. I say it's, you know, it's a religion I grew up with. Um, and I love the Mormons and I speak very positively of it when I can, but it's not my identity, you know? And I, I mean, um, I, but I get it. Like my husband, it, it was his identity, you know, and he grew up Mormon and it's, it's different for him, you know, uh, than it is for me. And I have a lot of compassion for that. If, if you were to tell me all of a sudden that like, Iran disclaims you, you know, um, I'd be like, Oh, well, I thought I was Iranian, you know, and, and, and what does that mean then for me to not be that? So I think that's more, um, you know, I'm more viscerally, you know, uh, that than I am Mormon. Like even when I was Mormon, when people said bad things about Mormons, I was never like, I'm shaken to my like core, you know, and I've talked to my Mormon friends who would be, who felt like personally attacked. And for me, it was like, Oh, that's not right. Don't say that. But I never felt personally attacked because it was, not a, a visceral connection I had uh, because of, you know, just my family's history. Hmm. I'll just say it's, it's super hard to not have a, a people, you mm -hmm. know? Um, yeah. And I still think that this is something that many people who aren't able to keep attending church or struggling with where we're still able to find friendships and online communities and, mm -hmm. and there are some in-person communities that have broken out, but, I, I sense that you may have read uh, Sapiens. Have you read Sapiens? Oh, yeah. I love Sapiens. I love it. And Homo Duet, the second one. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Like myth myth and community are yeah. essential. And yeah. Yeah. when you just, it's not like dropping out of a religion equates mm -hmm. to health and happiness and well-being. That's not how it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. And we, we are biologically driven to create myths and explanations and we are biologically driven to have a tribe and a people and so when you're thrown out of the one tribe that you knew like biologically it's gonna hurt and so I get that like I get it you know I I, I have never been able to like claim a tribe but Mormonism was the closest I ever came and I still do and this is why I think this community of ex-Mormons I think this is great like this is people who at least understand each other you know um, and and all, all and I guess all I want want to say about that is like let's have a tribe without enemies, you know. Let's have a tribe, put down the spears, and just have a tribe of people that you know, a porous border, you know. But enemies help you rally, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, but but you're right. You're right. We we need a tribe without enemies. I love that. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you think you'll ever have a tribe again? I mean, that's your theme, right? Your theme yeah. is sort of a woman, a woman without a tribe. And you, you find yourself sort of more tribalist than, than maybe you were. And you don't, you don't have a tribe to hand to your children when you know that this tribe was so useful to your family, right? Yeah, and I, 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 want, I want to not have a tribe. I want to, because mm. I think to have a tribe means that there is another. There is an out. And I've been always you on the You mean an out. in and an out. You're in, in but in that is. You're in the tribe and you're out of the tribe. And so any tribe you create is going to have an you know, an outsider. And I've always been that outsider. And I just don't, I don't, uh, I, I, I want to sort of overcome that biological urge to tribe myself. And so I, and I, I hope that my kids can too. And you're going to naturally fall into some ruts, you know, the kids have cliques and they you know, have a kid in middle school. And so they're, they're, that tribalism runs deep, but I want, I want us to fight it as much as we can. That is your, I think that's the summative theme of your life is you always felt 
like you didn't quite fit in a tribe. And for you, it seems like enlightenment has been accepting Mm -hmm. that you don't have a single tribe and that that's actually maybe a good thing in some ways. Yeah, that's right. Because even Iranians, like when I'm in Iran, I'm not an Iranian. My my cousins in Iran, they don't consider me one of them. Iranian Americans, I'm not one of them because they were the Shah's people. So there isn't a group of people in this world who I can fit in comfortably, who understands my life, except for my immediate family. But I, but again, like I said, like I think that has given me something that maybe other people don't have, which is what it's like to not have to rely on your tribe, right? You, you go out there and you figure it out yourself. Well, Mersa Baradaran, I want you in my tribeless tribe. <laughs> Let's do it. No spears, <laughs> no border wall. No borders, no enemies. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think it's been at least two hours and, and maybe a little bit more, maybe two and a half hours. And I, this has definitely been one of my favorite interviews ever. And I hope everybody listens to it. And you are a treasure <laughs> to your family, your treasure to your native country, and you're a treasure to us, even though, you know, in some ways we're still trying to find out uh, who we are and where we belong. But I'm so honored. I'm honored. Uh, yeah. That you came on Mormon Stories. I'm, I'm admiring your work. And I wish you and your family and your career and your life just all the success. In, and I hope you just keep shining and and teaching us because we need what you're teaching so thank, thank you. you i likewise i mean I, I thank you for what you're doing for the community and for you know bringing you uh, creating a tribe of people who don't have a tribe and i think that is a huge huge benefit thank you all right well uh her name is is mersa baradaran the books are How the Other Half Banks, Exclusion, Exploitation, and the Threat to Democracy, and The Color of Money, Black Banking and the Racial Wealth Gap, uh, published by Harvard University Press. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We had a lot of people listening. Just so you know, 23,354 people were reached by this podcast, wow. over 3,000 views, and oh, that's yeah. before we release it. Tens of thousands will listen uh, through YouTube and through. I would have worn something nicer. iTunes. Oh, you look great. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, so, so thanks again. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Please uh, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Please contribute to the blog. Go to mormonstories.org. Tell Marissa how much you loved and respected everything she had to say. Um, be respectful if you want to challenge or disagree with what she has to say. Thanks to everyone who supports Mormon Stories. Your financial contributions make this possible. You can donate at mormonstories.org to keep this sort of thing alive. We want to thank uh, Cody Layton and Amy Grubbs, who are the staff of the OSF, that make all this possible, along with the OSF board. And we just want to say we've really loved this series on sort of the people of color. We did a bunch of uh, interviews on, on the Lamanites and losing the Lamanites. Um, and we've got more good stuff ahead. So... Uh, I'm just, I pinch myself every day that I get to do what I do and I'll keep doing it until you guys stop supporting it. So again, Marissa, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the listeners. And we'll see you guys again soon on Mormon Stories. Take care, everybody.